Welcome to Insights as a Service. This week, we're doing something a little bit different because I had a chat with Nigel Moore, the founder of the Tech Tribe, a community that educates and really brings together MSPs from around the world. And that chat with Nigel, it went for quite a while. So we split it into two parts. And the first part uh, today, we're going to be talking about uh, Nigel's business background. He has worked in MSPs, run MSPs, and of course, now has this community that's really empowering MSPs to grow, to scale, uh, and to operate more effectively. So let's get into part one with Nigel Moore from the Tech Tribe. Nigel Moore, uh, Tech Tribe, thanks for coming in and having a chat. Most of the people that we want to be listening to this, the MSPs uh, that are out there, many will know who you are. Um, we were even talking to a, um, a lady called Harriet who runs a sales consultancy um, organization the other day and, and she knew who you were as well. Um, it seems to me that everyone uh, kind of does, but just in case someone's listening who doesn't, why don't you give us the quick sort of 101, where you've come from, what you're doing now. The 30 second pitch. Uh, used to own an MSP for many years, uh, sold the MSP in 2016 and created a community and program called the Tech Tribe where we now teach and educate and help other MSPs to avoid all the stupid crap that I did wrong for the, the 10, 15 years that I was in the MSP space. And uh, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. It, there's not Love more it. complicated than that. That is a strong elevator pitch. Uh, you wouldn't go too many stories up before you got that out. <laughs> Great. All right. I want to, to unpack all of that though. So, okay. Uh, based on what I know uh, and what I've read, you got into IT sort of 98, which puts you in roughly the same vintage as me, I think, um, in terms <laughs> of years uh, on the planet. Uh, when did you actually kick off that, that MSP uh, and what did you know of what you were trying to achieve when you did that? Oh, good question. So I, I started in the, you could call it the MSP world, but it was IT support back then because MSP didn't really exist. Back in 2002, 2003, uh, working for another IT support company, then just a very small B2B IT support company. And um, and I, I worked with that business for probably five-ish years and, and eventually became the general manager. And then eventually that, um, the, the through a crazy turn of events, I ended up um, one Monday morning owning my own business out of that business and that business disappeared. And um, that was in about 2008. So I was probably five years running that other one and helping that other one. And then um, then I had my own come one Monday morning. There was no rhyme or reason or goals or anything behind the start of my business except for to be able to survive and eat. And okay. um, and so I kicked it off 50 grand. I was kind of 50 grand in credit card debt because I was stupidly spending on silly stuff that I didn't need. And sitting on my dining room table with a horrible old laptop, which is all I had. And um, and just had to kick the thing off from there. And so the, for the first year or two, it was just paddling to survive and swimming, trying to survive and not drown and, and whatnot. And, and um, there was no plan or anything. And that was, as I started to get my own MSP, that's when I, I started to open up into the world or, or as, as I was building my own MSP slash IT support business, that opened my eyes up. And I started seeing in a, around the community in Australia of all these other companies doing the same thing. And I started going, oh, there's actually a, an actual industry here. I'd been doing the whole thing without knowing there was an entire industry around it. And, um, and started learning from some other people around what they were doing and managed services with fixed fee service agreements and, and stuff like that and started implementing and trying all of that stuff and breaking all of that stuff a lot. And, um, and eventually, as I said, in 2016, we ended up selling that, that MSP and, um, and that journey going from 2008, starting it to 2016, selling it, we tried everything and failed at pretty much everything and had some success and had some wins. And, um, and I remember in the, the early years I was, I was working 70, 80, 90, sometimes 100 hour weeks, uh, earning 20, 30, $40,000 a year in the business. And, um, and it was horrendous poor, and it was tough, and really tough. Right, and, yeah, it's horrible, out of, out of whack. And, it, and I went through some mental health challenges through that time, just when you're in a, a mode like that, like it takes its toll on you. And, um, and ended up over the, the years digging myself out of that stuff and starting to build a business that we never got large. We were only 10 staff when we sold the business, but um, we were quite profitable at that point in time. And I got to the point where it only needed me 10 to 15 hours per week when we sold the business. And so we were able to architect a, a fairly good sale for our size business. And I was able to quietly step out the back door and, um, and not really, no one really noticed that I was gone, which was good. Um, in the so so when, when you were in that business that sort of overnight you ended up running, so, so it wasn't that you, uh, like from scratch had to build up your own, you, you, you sort of took up some level of existing um, business, but then Correct. how, how hard was it for you then coming in? You're still relatively young. You're still pretty kind of new. You'd be at five years experience, I guess, not a hell of a lot really in the scheme of things. How hard was it for you to not look at the way things were being done and go, well, I guess this is just how it's done. Like how hard was it for you to kind of strip that back and go, all right, let's take a, a fresh look at this and just start, 
questioning all of these these assumptions that maybe you had? It was probably in the last year of of running that other MSP that I started to started to just see the inklings of this industry that existed, and I started to see a few um, a few blogs from people that were talking about how the industry ran and whatnot, and that started to get me on the path of hey we could do some things different here and we can, we can try some things. But when I, whenever I floated it with, with management, it was always pushback because it wasn't my business and the ideas were new and they wanted to do things their way and whatnot. And that, that kind of started the whole um, getting a little bit frustrated with the direction they were going. And then, then there was a, a big other complete chain of events that happened along with that thing that ended up seeing me and everybody else exit that business all at the same time. Um, and that business ended up shutting shop that day pretty much um, when we all left. But, um, but that's the, that then meant that I started with a certain subset of clients, like a bunch of clients came to me on the Monday and said, Hey, what are you doing? And I said, well, I don't know, not much. And they said, well, can we work with you? And I went, okay. Um, and so I, I started from that. And that's, that literally was just me, as I said, with a laptop running around, just doing break fix per hour work with no, no, um, no plan of attack, no anything in there, just helping out people that were asking for help and screaming at me for help because they didn't have anywhere else to go to. And I'd, I'd been working with them for years up until then. Um, and so that was it. And that, that was then when it was my business, then that was when I was able to really start to go, okay, now let's see what I can change and what I can tweak and what I can learn about how this industry operates and whatnot. And, um, and start to implement some of the things that I was seeing some of the bigger, larger MSPs that I was starting to, to become, um, or starting to hear about and see what they were doing. I could start to implement some of those things in my own. And like when you were starting to, to implement those things, starting to look around, trying to learn from, you know, what you were seeing in the industry. Was that because you know you you felt like you were trying to work towards an exit, or at that point was it simply not that there is oh, no. an outcome here? It's just I'm just I just want to do things better. I just want to see what I can do with this. I, at, at the earliest, I wish there was something as complicated as that. It was simple. Of like in those early days, it was literally I just wanted to survive. I just I, from a very early age, I had this this inkling that I always wanted to to run my own business. I'd look at business owners and and just be in awe. But I came from a, a background where our family had zero business owners in it. My, my dad worked for the government for 35 years in, in the same job for 35 years. My mom didn't work at all. Um, my whole life, she was a, a, a stay-at-home mom. And we didn't have any friends that were business owners in our entire group at all. And we were very, um, I'm not going to say we were poor, but we were like, we didn't have any money whatsoever. Mom and dad had a kind of um, struggle to get to bring us up. And so... When I came into this this world, I always I'd see business owners on TV shows or whatever, and I'd be going, "Oh my goodness! Like that is my dream to be able to run a business and and do that kind of stuff." But but I'm not the kind of person that can. I, I'm I'm born into the world that doesn't get to run a business, and so when that kind of point happened, it was like, "Hey, I've got like this chance here now. Like maybe I could run a business." And my my brain at that point was still, "Nigel, you're not going to be able to do it. You're going to crash and burn. You're going to fail. Like nothing's going to work here." Um, but there was still that other part of me that was just like just keep bloody trying and, and because you've got to feed yourself, just keep doing what you got to do here. And so yeah. I just kept pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. And, and it was, it, it probably took a couple of years, I would say, until I then started to really take things professionally. Instead of looking at it as a way to feed myself, I then started looking at it as a, a business that I wanted to build with impact and, and clients that, that loved what we did and a brand around the thing and staff that loved working for the business and whatnot. And that probably took going through those first two years of just trying to live to get in that point where I then went, okay, well, we're kind of living now. Let's see if we can actually build something real here that, that maybe I can go and do what I saw those people do in those TV shows when I was a kid out there. Yeah. It's interesting. Like uh, I was looking um, at, um, was it uh, Teeth Capital that you're involved in as well? Yep. And, and hearing you talk there and the two combined make it fairly clear that culture for you and, and enjoying what you do and, and giving that sense of purpose to your, your team is pretty, pretty huge, right? Pretty important. So like when, when did you start to, was it simply that you looked at your own experience and went, I can't keep mm. busting my ass like this, that you went, well, you, you had that empathy, I guess, that you, you saw other yeah. people busting their ass and you went, how can I make this more fun for them? Uh, that, that's definitely a big part of it. I, I went, like, not just me, a number of us went through a horrible time in that last business where, um, where there was some, some um, I won't dive into it, but there was some horrible no, challenges fair. that we all went through in that, that particular business. And, um, and that, that left us all coming out with, holy crap, we know what not to do here. Like this is not how to treat staff, yeah, right? And, yeah. and we, we all saw the mental health challenges that it, that it laid on us and went, holy crap, like I don't ever want to do anything like that. But I also, um, growing up with, <laughs> if you're watching this thing, you would see that I've got long orange hair and I have a name of Nigel. And so when I went through school, <laughs> when I went through primary school, um, I was the, the um, redheaded rat rooting Nigel no friends. And, um, and so I got bullied like crazy in school. But what that did was it, it, it 
put this thing in me that, or back then of I always wanted to try and fit in because if I fit in and I'd kind of made myself um, kind of sneak in the covers and whatever, people wouldn't bully me. And so I, my whole life I was trying to fit in and just be one, a person that people liked and um, mm. because I didn't – like I got a bunch of that bullying happening in, in primary school. And, and that to me then played out in my business in that I just wanted people to like what I did and I wanted people to, to come in and, and enjoy working for me and working with me and working alongside me. And so I, I, I was always pushing to, to I, like, I, I just wanted to be the, the polar opposite of the, the cranky boss that, that berates and demands and the benevolent dictator kind of person in there. I just wanted the exact opposite of that. And I, I probably pushed it too far to the opposite end, becoming best friends with a ton of yeah. team members and struggling with how to lead them and manage them at that point in time because we were so darn friendly. But I've always erred on that side nowadays. And, and even now, you're, our, our team, is, we've got a very close, close, night, close tight-knit team. And, uh, and I will cast them all as friends now, even in the tech tribe. And, and I err a little bit more on that as I go through business um, versus being the, the dictator or the, the manager that's there just to make sure the KPIs are looked after. And I'm sure that has some downsides, but it's me. It's way I, I'm building this business the way I want to build it. And, um, and, and that means that I want, I want people to love what they do and to feel welcomed and to feel appreciated and to, to go home at the end of the day knowing that they've, they've got a, an important part in a business that's out there doing good things and, and creating good things and having an impact with our clients out there. It's interesting. Um, for what it's worth, I got bullied the hell out of it primary school as well. I think kids generally are the worst. Uh, oh, yeah, so yeah. Yep. Um, we probably are. can agree on that. Um, yeah. Except mine, of course, they're all right, I suppose. Um, but <laughs> the, um, I think that, 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 that experience can actually push you a couple of ways. One, you want to fit in. You want everyone to like you. You want to kind of make up for lost time and be popular. The other one is you can put up a lot of barriers and kind of keep everyone at a distance yeah. because you don't, you don't really want to let them in. And um, you and I probably went different paths on that. I'm probably just coming around to your way of thinking now where I'm like, you know what? I, 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 I want to have connections. I want to have that, that, um, that joy at work and actually get to know and enjoy right. the time I've, um, I've got with these, with these people. So yeah, but a uh, key thing there is uh, kids are the worst. Um, all right. So um, I guess <laughs> They are. When, when you sold your MSP, when you when you exited, was there a, a feeling of, of, oh, thank God I'm out or I've achieved what I aim to achieve? Or was there a sense of almost a loss? Like you'd put so much into it, you'd, you'd kind of attached your own sort of personality a bit to it. There was both. Um, both parts, nearly in equal measure in there. We'd, we'd built something over years and, and I had a business partner at that time as well. In 2014, we, um, myself and another friend merged our two businesses together. So we spent the last two years together and during that time, the goal was to set it up for an eventual sale in there. We, we were at that point where we wanted to set it up as an eventual sale. And, and at the very end, I, I remember on closing day of the business before we told the staff um, or uh, as we were signing the deal, we, we both sat there and we were, we were nearly in tears uh, because we, and we just like our, my heart rate was through the roof and so was my, my business partners. And we're just like, like, this is going to be one of the hardest things we've ever done in our life is telling our team about this. And I remember one of our team members, um, one of the girls who'd been working for us for a number of years, who was an, our operations manager, was an amazing team member. Um, we, we told her first. She was one of the first people that we told. And um, we wanted to do kind of one-on-one. -on -one. We were very close with the team. We didn't want to do it in a group thing, so we did it one-on-one. -on -one. I remember she walked in and um, we sat her down and we said, oh, we've got some news. Uh, we've just signed a deal where we're going to be acquired. And like, um, her first thing was, are you guys going? And we're like, no, we're, we're going to be around for a bit. Like there's some integration or whatever. And she goes, are you guys going to be there for the long term? We're like, probably not long term. And like she burst into tears, like tears streaming out of her face. And, um, and that, like I, even now I'm getting teared up just mm. thinking about that story because that's, that's the kind of impact that we had. And that was incredibly hard when we got to that and just talking to the team and, and working them through it. And that, that month or two was, was like that. We built something. And then we hand it, it's like a baby, right? You build a business, it's like your own baby. And then you're handing it to someone else and going, hey, can you continue bringing up my baby? Hopefully you've got the same values as us in bringing up our baby over here. And, and they, uh, they ended up having slightly different values and went a different direction with it and whatnot. And, and over time, we, we had to just kind of step away and just let them do their thing because they were, they were going the route that they were going and, and whatnot. But yeah, it was incredibly hard. But there was also on the flip side, I'd been in the game since 2002 doing IT support um, until 2016. And so there was a sense of relief at the same time. And that sense of relief didn't come the minute we signed the deal. It slowly came over the next couple of weeks slash month or two after the deal happened in that, that I was now not the ultimate escalation point in an IT support business. I'd been that ultimate escalation point for 12 to 14 years or whatever it happened to be. Um, and that can be incredibly taxing in there. Absolutely. And so that sigh of relief did absolutely come. And luckily enough, we... um. 
we already before we figured out when this deal was going to close my my me and my wife had a um a trip booked into france and another one booked into um to thailand and so they ended up that that happened two weeks after we we sold the business was the france trip and i think it was five weeks uh, my wife is french so we, we typically go over there a couple of times each year when we're allowed not anymore no. and um and so that that trip kind of put a like a full stop on the end of that journey we, we came back and most of the integration had been done and and i'd kind of stepped out that back door nice and quietly and just helped out with a little behind the scenes things and um so there was both there was equal measures of both that was incredibly sad but in we also had that weight lifted off the shoulders in there. And I think it came at the most perfect time for us, perfect time for um, the people buying it, I think as well. It helped them get some certain things in their business that they were looking for. And um, and our staff all, some of them stayed, some of them left. One of them's now the service manager of that new business. Um, one of our, the techs that I'd hired many, many years earlier, um, he's just hitting his 10 year long service leave right now. He, he told me the other day, uh, but he's, he's now the, he's, graduated from like level one tech that he started off with me all the way up to now being the service manager of the business and seeing stories like that come out of the journey makes it all the more better that it's not just about us building a business, but these guys have built a career in there as well and gone on to do good things. That's awesome. Sub question. How's your French? Très mal. <laughs> <laughs> Very bad. Horrible. Right. <laughs> Horrific. Oh, well, there's, uh, there's still time. There's still time. <laughs> there is. Even the kids, uh, like my wife only at, Oh, she's getting better now, but at one stage she only swore at them in French, and that was it. It was like, "Man, hurry up and man," and that was it. Um, but we're we're trying. We've just had another. Um, we've had our third recently, and he's eight, nine months old now, and um, and we're try, kind of committed that we're going to at least try and keep him learning French through the process um, nice. a little bit more than what we did with the girls. Oh, that's a fantastic opportunity to be bilingual as a kid. It's a it's a shame. Oh, I think God. if you if you miss out, I wish yeah, I yeah. had would, someone teach me something. It. Yeah, yeah, much younger. That's cool. Anyway, look back to the uh, back to the topic at hand. So, uh, one last question about that period before we move on to Tech Tribe and try and understand kind of the the catalysts and 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 what you've gone on to do from there and what you're seeing in the market. So, uh, the 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 last question from that other part is when you managed to get to the point where you were kind of ten to fifteen hours um, uh, a week in the business, but kind of working on the business. Uh, was it hard at all for you to? kind of remove yourself from being the, the customer facing sort of personality of the business and, and be more behind the scenes. And I ask that because, you know, we work with a number of MSP owners in, in, in our gig at Lightwire and I see so many of them struggle with that. I, I look at what they've grown. I'm like, you've got this opportunity to kind of step yeah. back a bit and just, just make it even better and bigger and focus on scaling and, and all that good stuff, but they just can't seem to extract themselves. Oh, yeah. so what was it like for you? Oh, I got stuck in that that challenge for years. Um, with the whole, I can, I, no one can do it as good as me, and no one can have, handle these client relationships as good as me, and all of that that crap, and which is mm. all just mind trash, is what I call it. And um, and it took me many years. In in the last couple of years, um, before we sold, I ended up moving three hours away from my MSP, and so we lived on a farm, um, three hours north of Sydney. My MSP was in Sydney, and so I was able to work. What I did was I. I um, I split my time between Sydney and the farm. And so I would come to Sydney only two nights a week and, and work in the MSP those days. And then the rest of the time I was up at the farm. So that kind of set at least some physical separation to the business. And that meant that on the days when I was up at the farm, I wasn't the person that people came and talked to about things. They, they would go and figure out things on their own a little bit more. And, and that helped me take that kind of step above the business and look at it more from a 20,000 foot view and think, okay, well, what, what systems and, and processes and accountability and, um, and, SOPs do we need to have in place to make sure that I'm not going to get pulled into all of these decisions here. If we're going to set this business up so that it's not reliant on me all day, every day, we're going to have systems and the guys need to know when they're, how they can make decisions in the business. And so we, we created a bunch of things like decision matrices so that the team used to know exactly how they could make decisions, how much money that decision could impact the business, what happened if that decision turned out bad and all that sort of stuff so that they knew that they were in, enabled to do that stuff on behalf of the business without having to come to me and say, hey, Nigel, what should we do here? And, and over years, I, I started imprinting in them that the, the whole notion of don't come to me with a question, like come to me with your challenge and your specific, um, like, and the way that you your want to suggest right? we deal with it or you propose that we go and deal with it. And only come to me if it's over this amount of money impact to the business. If it's not, then don't worry about it. I just trust you to make a decision. And if it backfires, we'll go and deal with it afterwards. Um, and we'll go and figure out what happens afterwards. And that that was hard, like incredibly hard to go through that. Because I'm like most MSP, most business owners out there and that we're, we're so much of a control freak. Like we just so need to, like we're scared that if we 
take our hands off just a little bit off the steering wheel a little bit the car's going to swerve out of control and go crazy and smash into a tree and um and i had to that was horrible for my team because I, i didn't enable them to do everything anything and um and that meant that they couldn't give grow their own wings and fly in there. And I, I started to see that I, I lost some staff members in the very early stages um, because of that, because I was so micromanaging every single thing they did in there. Um, and, and I was starting to watch the mentors that were doing things and just, and, and seeing that how they, they enabled their team to go and make mistakes and try new things and learn new things and not berate them when they did make a mistake that or make a decision that, that failed. And so I started just very, very slowly just giving little bits and pieces here and there of things just kind of, loosening the rope a little bit more not for them more for me to get comfortable with the process and what surprised the crap out of me was as i did it they stepped up to the plate more than what i the 10 times more than what i expected them to and it's and when i look at it in hindsight i go man nigel you've had no no confidence in your team whatsoever when you should have had uber confidence in the team because they were all awesome they were all doing good things and they all had great ways of doing things and i was the one stifling and it wasn't them not being good enough it was me not giving them enough space to have wings and once I started doing that, um, it started. Like it, it, I'm not going to say I changed overnight, but it was probably a year or two process for me to go through that to start to realize that you get a good team member in place, you give them the frameworks and the boundaries and the confidence to go and do what they need to do, and the knowledge that if and when they stuff up, you're not going to berate them. You're going to be there to help deconstruct what went wrong. Then they're going to fly, and the, the right people will do whatever they can to to go and like. Humans are good by nature is a belief I've got. And, um, and you hire the right good humans in a business, you give them the, the, right, the right parameters for how to fly and, and where we want to fly to and whatnot and, and let them go and do it. And they, they will very, 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 very often surprise the crap out of you. And in those times when they don't and something breaks, uh, you sit down and you deconstruct it with them to help them understand how to work they could have made that decision better. And you put something in place, an SOP or a process or whatever it is, so that you avoid making that, that mistake again as a business. And that was one of our mantras in our business in the last couple of years was make a mistake once and it's a lesson. We're all going to make mistakes. I make mistakes still every day in my bloody business. And they're all lessons. Make a mistake twice though, and it's a choice. And, and choices are the ones that have consequences. And so we always, whenever we made a mistake, it was all about what are we going to learn from this mistake? What can the business change? What SOP can we put in place? What training can we do what expectation can we set better with a client or whatever it is can we put in place to avoid us as a business ever making that mistake again and and i've always kept that that mantra in my business now even in the tech tribe that and the the team are the same every time we make a mistake which we do we've made mistakes yesterday like just and but the team it's awesome to see them going okay we made this mistake here's what we're going to do to fix it up with the clients here's what we learned here's how we put it in place and that's that's an incredibly freeing thing as a business owner um to to see a team go and do that it sounds like you guys have that uh, in both businesses, your last one and, and Tech Tribe, that you've got this retrospective process, you know, mm. each time a mistake is made, that whether it's formal or informal, is it is it something formal you guys do or is it more of a... We, we typically do, yeah. So okay. even yesterday, um, we, we've been rolling out this big backend uh, member management system in our business that, that was um, with, replaces our entire member management system. It's completely behind the scenes. Our members don't see anything, but it's been driving us, the, the old system has been driving us mad for years. And, um, and our developer, like we, we had this bug that popped up over the weekend that caused pain or not pain, but it caused a bunch of people to be really confused because it, it was telling them that their account was paused, even though they weren't. And, um, and so we, we troubleshooted the root cause, figured out the root cause. And, um, and then that was, easy, that, was, that was the easy part. We then, like one of the things we always do is whenever we stuff up something or we cause one of our members angst or pain, we typically go and send them a little gift, something physical in the post to say, hey, just a quick apology to, to, to say we screwed up and here's something to, to, to be, um, to, to, to say sorry. Um, and so we did all of that stuff. But then we, we sat down and on, on a Zoom call yesterday. It was just a half an hour Zoom call and it was with me deconstructing with a developer exactly what went wrong in that process that led to the bad decisions that made that bug happen. And, um, and, and he was, like, that was it. He, we went through that as a formal thing. And, um, and we do that very regularly in, in any time we make any sort of mistake as a team. And the, the key is that the guys know there's no emotion involved in that thing. It's not like, hey, you screwed up. Let's, um, like, I'm going to berate you here for a screw up. It's like, hey, this happened. We know issues happen. We, you can't have a business without issues. Let's go and deconstruct it now and figure out where we could have made that decision better. And we, I, pin, I, like, I helped him use the thought process to drill right down to the exact decision that he made and how he could have made that particular decision differently the next time around so that, um, so that it would have avoided that mistake. And, and right. it was, he, he came out at the end of that going, yeah, I can see perfectly now in hindsight how we made it and how I could have thought differently and whatever. 
And now we won't make that mistake again or a type of that mistake again in our business, hopefully. Um, mm. And that's, that's to us is it's a, it's a, we've, we've been doing it for years and, and it's a semi, semi formal thing, but we make it casual. Like it's a, we're just deconstructing what went wrong. There's nothing bad about it. Everything, people, yeah. things are always going to go wrong in a complex business. You're looking to learn, not to blame, right? And it's just yeah, 100%. going through that. And just going back to your point before about, um, you know, I guess giving your team the the freedom to, I guess, you know, put their own mark on the business. We, we I think you and I would like to think we, we back ourselves to hire the right people. You know, we have the right processes in place to get the right people on board. And the last thing you want to do then is limit their effectiveness by, by being too involved yeah. or, or, you know, putting yourself in as a handbrake to kind of go, well, I don't really want you doing more than the absolute minimum because I kind of yeah. want to control everything. So, yeah, I've been through a very similar learning process. But okay, so you, you put all of those um, systems, those processes in place to allow your people to do more. Were they the basis for what you've done at Tech Tribe? Because I guess to take a quick step back, um, as I understand it, and totally call me on this if I get it wrong, but you know, Tech Tribe offers a lot of templates, a lot of resources, a community, um, constant upskilling. Uh, but I assume to even kind of kick it off, you had to, you had to have the guts of something meaningful. Was that where that came from? Uh, a lot of the stuff that kicked off the beginning of the tech trial was some of the the things that I had created to help our MSP um, grow and kick and get up and running and things that in the last year or two of owning my MSP, I'd been, I was pretty deeply involved in lots of MSP communities around the place um, in Australia and overseas. And, and I was, um, I, there was a number of times where I'd be sitting with another MSP and I'd see that they've got a challenge that I'd, I'd solve in our business. And I'd be sitting there and I'd be kind of consulting for free, working them or coaching them through the process of how to solve that particular challenge. Uh, sometimes it was with some training. Sometimes it was, it was with a document or a resource or a template or whatever it happened to be. And, um, and that was what gave me the, it was probably about three or four years before I sold the MSP actually. And that was what gave me the light of, Hey, I freaking love this helping other MSPs improve as well. And, um, whilst we do this stuff in our business, it's even more fun to go and do it across tons of businesses out there and, and help them all. And so that kind of planted the seeds with some of that stuff of, and the, the very first version of the tech tribe, when I look back on it now, is horrendous, like embarrassing that we even, um, we even had it. But as I think it's Reed Hoffman, the, the founder of LinkedIn says, if you're not uh, embarrassed by the first version of your product, then you ship too late. And we were an absolute <laughs> shining example of that. Um, and so we, we, right we just had, yeah, exactly. We just had some basics in there, but for me, it was, um, I just had this vision that I just wanted to help MSPs do better at their business, knowing how hard it was to be in the trenches and find the time to work on the, the business yourself. And I had this, my brain has always had this kind of systems thinking mentality where I always see a, a process or see inside a business and then deconstruct it into its, its system parts and then figure out how to, how to layer things into the, all those different system parts. And so every time I was seeing a challenge in our business, I'd always be like stepping above it and going, okay, well, we need this process here or this thing here or this resource or whatever it was. And so the tribe, the tech tribe has kind of organically grown from that. We started off with those kind of horrible basic things. It, we flew more on the momentum of people just wanting to join this new movement that I'd created more than actually valuable stuff in there. And, um, and then over the, the years, it's, just, it's literally just gone to where our members have the challenges. So wherever we're seeing the, the biggest challenges, which is typically around growth, like marketing and sales. Um, as well as pricing and packaging, we typically just go to help them solve those challenges in whatever ways we possibly can. And some of that's with courses and content and training and reads like templates and pricings and my book and all of those sorts of things are ways that we go and, and help them solve those particular challenges in the business. It was not, um, and, and the more, we're very lucky because we have that community. We've got a community now of, I think we've got about 7,000 people inside that community, inside the tribe. And, um, and that's made up of, of about 3,000 MSPs and all their team members. And so every day people are talking in there about all their challenges and all the things that are going on and the good stuff and the bad stuff and throwing ideas in there and sharing inspiration and whatever. And so we're, we're in this lucky space where we see all of that. And that's our market research. We look in there and we go, okay, well, seems a lot of people are challenged with this. Let's figure out a way to solve it for them. And, and often nowadays, it's not something that I did back in my MSP. It's something that I then need to go out into the world and go, okay, well, we need to now solve this particular marketing angle or whatever it is. I'm going to go out and figure out how the best people in the world are solving that. And I'm going to deconstruct the crap out of all of their, their different things and figure out how it can apply to an MSP and bring it all together so that an MSP can go and use those, those um, methods or tactics or strategies or whatever it happens to be. And so that's the approach we take now. And, um, okay. and we, we kind of get that, that super visible 20,000 foot view insight into the whole thing. Which countries are you operating in now? Nearly everything. I think mean, we've got, yeah. we got 3000 members around the world, it's, but it's, 
if you if you look at the, the metrics, it's forty eight percent US. Uh, I think it's about sixteen percent Canadian, eighteen um, percent UK. I think Australia is maybe seventeen or eighteen percent, and then the okay. rest of the world fits in around there. Uh, we're probably another f- forty countries. My, my follow up question, I guess, let's take those major markets. Then, yeah. do you see like a, a a divergence in in issues or the way the issues expressed between those markets? You know, is is US very different than Australia or UK to Canada, or is it very much that it's a global industry and the the, the problems Ooh. seem to? Good question. I love this question because so many people think there are wild differences between everything. And they're like, Oh, that'll never happen. That'll never work out here in Australia or that'll never work over in the UK. What you guys are doing in the U S and when I get there and I deconstruct it and I go and find an MSP that's doing it out here in Australia, I realize that those, the differences are there, but they're so minor that people, people amplify them more as an excuse than anything else to not go and want to try something new out there. And so, so, there is differences in um, in a little bit in sales side of things. There's sometimes differences in the pricing levels that you can get um, in like in the US compared to the UK market. There's typically a, a big differential in pricing. Uh, but what I will say is that the majority of the differences are actually not reality when you when you go out and you test the test it in the marketplace. They're mostly inside people's heads, and they've they've just okay. listened. They've been in this echo chamber, and they've listened to all their friends around them. And they've just assumed that stuff is real when they haven't gone out and actually tested it in their marketplace. And they would have realized that if they tested it, it's actually not real. They've just unfortunately got stuck in that echo chamber of people around them. And there, as I said, there is nuances. There's price differentials. There's a few different things, but nowhere near the level what most people believe that there is out there. Under, underpinning the whole thing, the, the industry is very, like when I see behind the scenes of so many MSPs all around the world, it is very, 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 very similar between them all. Okay. So touching on pricing, you just mentioned it there. Um, I'm a big believer in in value based pricing, right? You, know, yep. you 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 define your value premium against the competition, or within a segment, or or defining who you're selling to and what value you can offer to that segment, and and from there you can come up with a value premium, which translates to a pricing premium. But that kind of comes back to in the MSP market today, how easy or difficult is it to, in your opinion, really differentiate one MSP from another, and in, in what is I think increasingly commoditized in, in terms yeah. of the licensing models, et cetera. Well, it is the, the commoditization happens in any industry and it's happening in ours for like crazy, but it's only happening in all these boring base levels, RMM monitoring, maintenance, patch management, mo- all of that sort of stuff at, at help desk, even all of that stuff is commoditized like crazy. And so if you want to compete on that, you're going to be competing in a, in a red ocean full of other sharks that are, that are munching on everyone. And, um, and you're going to struggle. Um, unless you're going for volume and you've got marketing budgets like crazy where you can you can go and, and spend loot, stupid dollars to go and attract tiny clients in there and you go for that whole volume play. But most MSPs can't go for that. And so so what I see out in the marketplace is the MSPs that are differentiating are differentiating at the business level. They've, they've, all, they've realized that all that stuff is commoditized. Help desk is commoditized. Service delivery is commoditized. Product, uh, projects work is all commoditized. The stuff that's not commoditized is customer experience. The stuff that's not commoditized is business consulting and, and um, technology adoption and all of these sorts of things. And that's where you can absolutely differentiate by offering those sort of things by, by going into all of your clients. And instead of having the technical discussions that most MSPs are still having with their clients, you get in there and you lead with business level discussions. And you sit down and you really understand what, what are their goals in their business? What are their drivers in their business? What are their, their opportunities in their business? What are their weaknesses in their business? And you talk to them from a business perspective and an ROI perspective and a capital in, capital return on capital perspective. And you will differentiate yourself just by having those conversations versus every other MSP that's out there is going, well, we're going we're gonna to be fast and we've got mm. technicians that are certified and we've got all of these things that 10 years ago, they were good differentiators, but it's all commoditized. They're not anymore. You can't differentiate on those things. And so there's that, there's customer experience as well, where you, you're out there and you're, you're building, like I used to always say to my team that we're not a tech company, we're, we're a customer service company that just happens to know about tech. And so we always had this underlying um, focus on building amazing customer experience in every area that we could in there. And we, we, we weren't great at it, but we were good at it and mm-hmm. it helped set us apart. It helped, it helped our clients go, oh, I, I love dealing with the tech or with my msp because of this or because of that just those little nuances not it was wasn't how fast we installed a computer or how quick we responded it was all the little extra things that we added onto the relationship to to drive that customer experience and um and i see that as a big differentiator nowadays because that's that not only helps um your current clients go and talk to their friends about you if you go and create create situations where they want to but it also drives 
super high retention out there. Like if you've got this amazing customer experience and your, your clients aren't going to want to go anywhere, but if you're just out there trying to compete on price and you're trying to compete on all the commoditized stuff, your customers are just going to price shop. They're going to go somewhere else because you've, you've, you've got nothing else to compete on. Um, yeah. And the other one out there that I would say that's, that's a massive area for opportunity. And this one's hard. Um, is just brand. I never understood brand when I was younger. I never understood the power of brand uh, when I was younger. And now in the latter years of my MSP, I started to understand it. In the tech tribe, I understand it a whole lot more now and that brand is important. And branding and, and building your brand and your brand ethos is wildly important to get people along for the ride and get people to come along and, and want to join you. And the, the, the MSPs that are out there that are building these amazing brands based off things that are different out there and, and quirky and cool and fun and funky or whatever it happens to be, are the ones that are, are winning in sales deals left, right, and center because they're they're standing out from the crowd not only with their brand, not only with their their business conversations and bring everything back to to ROI and all that sort of stuff, but also because they've got they've invested in the little brand out there. They don't have that Jimmy Joe's PC computer repairs logo that was designed in 1990. They've gone and put some intentional time and focus on building a brand that actually can come along and and share that same professionalism that that they're, they're giving with those business level discussions and the technology adoption and the, the ROI conversations and budgeting and all that kind of stuff that they're doing. Mm. I think what you've done really well with Tech Tribe, um, I saw it in, I guess, my research over the last few days, trying to make sure I had some stuff to talk about yeah. with you and knew what the hell I was talking about, uh, which is still questionable, um, is <laughs> you put some real personality into the brand. And I think a lot of brands are really scared to do that. But yeah. the problem is if we all end up just being these stock standard WordPress sites with corporate imagery and stock photos and stuff. I mean, it's not memorable. Nothing's going to stand out. And, um, you know, it's, it's that top of funnel play, right? Like you don't always have to be in, in, in lead gen mode. I think I talked about this a couple of weeks back, but it doesn't always have to be click to buy, but it could be click to learn more, add value, yeah. be, be, be yeah. front of mind, be in the picture when people are ready to make a purchasing decision and be seen as, as knowledgeable by offering content that matters. And I think that in its essence is actually kind of what you're doing with tech tribe. You're, you're actually, you, your your offering is content and knowledge um yeah. so it's it's yeah you've done that really well from what i can see yeah and msps have that same opportunity right like you, it's just injecting the human into your business and not not being afraid to to get out there and and mm. it, even even in my first years in the tech tribe it scared the crap like to jump on my first video was one of the most horrific experiences i think i've ever been through in my life but also on the flip side one of the most rewarding when i look at it and because it helped me get comfortable being the face of a company out there and, and putting some human into my brand. And as you said, like there's so many MSPs and, and businesses in any industry for that matter, that they have that boring WordPress site that's, that doesn't even mention the founder's name and does no photos of the team or anything on there. And I think just the basic steps are just get some photos of you up on your site and just show that there's a team there and humans behind the thing. Don't, don't hide behind it. Like get out front and be loud and proud about you being a bunch of humans behind the scenes. Cause People want to deal with humans that have personality and are fun and, and are knowledgeable and smart. And they don't I want to deal. That's they, so they, true. Yeah, that's crazy how much. And I, I fell into that. I was a victim of that for years. I'd look at it and go like, I don't want my face anywhere. I'm gonna, like, I'm the last person anybody want to see. But, but when I look at that now, that was one of the silliest things I ever, silliest decisions I made was thinking like that. And once I, I got over the, the fear of talking and, um, and being in front of a camera and, um, and all of that stuff that helped me then put my brand out in the marketplace, the world just became so much easier. Life, business, everything became so much easier. And people flocked to you a whole lot more because you, you, they're seeing the human behind the business. They're seeing the humans behind the business. I mean, as long as you're not a massive dickhead, um, you know, being <laughs> yourself at work is pretty rewarding, right? You shouldn't have to it put is. on some veneer to be something else at work. So um, I think... Uh, that, like people forget that B2B is still just people buying from people. Mm. And I think that's, that's to, to your point is, is really important to keep in mind. And people love authenticity. People love feeling like they can just relax, be themselves, have a genuine conversation and trust that the person they're talking to has their best interests at heart. And if you can convey that it, online through your website, through your socials, through the content you're creating, you're making life a lot easier for yourself. So that's, I think, yeah, you're, you're spot on. But I was going to ask um, with, with your, um, I guess your, your, your tribe, uh, your member base at the moment. Do you find a lot of um, people trying to understand the opportunity that exists for them uh, through the, I guess, the privacy legislation that's coming into play in various um, you know, jurisdictions, whether that's here in Australia with some changes recently or elsewhere, which I know nothing about, so I won't mm -hmm. try and pretend I do, uh, but I assume there's some stuff going on virtually yeah. everywhere. Uh, and also in the security space, like that's constantly evolving, right? There's, there's more stuff all the time. So is that a, an area where people particularly smaller MSPs, maybe feeling a little bit like, how do I make the most yeah. of this, but also make sure I'm not screwing up? 
Sure. Yeah. Um, so out of those two, the biggest one by far is security. So most small, okay. nim- or I call nimble MSPs uh, rather than small MSPs, but most nimble MSPs are not thinking in the privacy realm whatsoever, apart from uh, Europe where you've got GDPR, which is kind of, you, you can't bundle some GDPR compliance stuff into, into your MSP offerings semi simply because there's some vendors that, that do some really good stuff around that. But, but most okay. MSPs aren't looking at it as a, a key part of their revenue or whatnot, whereas security, like, holy crap, it's the, the last five years has just been the world's craziest mess and opportunity at the same time. And, and every MSP out there is scrambling to figure out how can we do security better. And, um, and I, I think if, if you're an MSP out there now, that, the, the privacy stuff can be good and you can niche down on that in certain areas. But, but let's face it, most business owners aren't going to bed at night wondering whether my privacy rules are, are sorted out and whatever. They're worried about hackers and they're worried about cybersecurity and they're worried about all of that stuff, my data and my backup or backups um, and stuff like that. And so you mm. still just got to go where people are worried and, and deal with that. And to me, the the threat of the hackers is still probably scarier than the threat of the government coming down on me for a, a breach of compliance or whatever yeah. it happens to be. Um, and, and most business owners are in the same boat. They're looking at these GDPR compliance or the, the same stuff that we've got out here and they're going, oh yeah, it's kind of worrying and whatever, but the hackers, like I see in the, in the media all day, every day, all of these people getting ransomware and all of this stuff and um, and whatnot. And it's just an easier sell for an MSP as well to, to get in and, and say, look, you guys have got risk here, risk here, this risk here, this one's look, looking good and whatever. Let's get you guys up to speed. Whereas privacy is, it's not there yet in terms of being such a, a big revenue driver and a, a big need that people are looking for. And that will happen more and more and more. Like in Europe, it's 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 definitely a, a level above what we have out here in Australia and even in the US it's um and, and Canada. Canada's a little bit more advanced than um than what we are here. But um but it's not not to the in, point in where every respect or just uh in, in Canada's more advanced in every respect or just probably uh, just, <laughs> more yeah. than likely. <laughs> yeah arguably we love yeah. Canadians. But yeah it's not it's just yeah. not it's not the hot topic that's needing to be addressed as much at the moment. I think it's probably a if you look at if you talk about 80 20 it's probably 80 percent um focus on cyber security and msbs right. trying to figure out how they can do better on that 20 percent, maybe even less on on privacy and, and those sorts of areas like the compliance side of things we're going to leave that there for this week that's part one with nigel done we're going to be with nigel again next week for part two and uh, we'll see you then to hear more about how he sees sales how he sees marketing uh, the mistakes that he sees MSPs make, how voice fits in, and a whole range of other things. In the meantime, if you want to find me on LinkedIn, you can do that, Brendan Ritchie, R-I-T-C-H-I-E. You can also get me at brendan at insightsasaservice.fm. We'll see you again soon.